Hello, everyone. In the last lecture, we talked about the closed form solution for linear regression. So the loss is this. Or you can represent it like this. Then we show that the loss is a convex function and um, every local optimum is a global optimum and we can seek for the local optimum or the global optimum by taking the derivative of the j with respect to a parameter, which would be okay, and we set it to zero, then I get my optimum is this suppose it's invertible. So if you apply this equation in your MATLAB or maybe Python or other toolkits, you automatically get this optimum, you know, by just one line of code. But we also mentioned that closed form solution is rare in more fancy models. Or maybe uh, it's not very numerical stable or maybe it's not efficient because you have to compute the inverse, which is not very fun. So in this lecture, we're going to seek for numerical optimization. By saying numerical optimization, I mean that it, it's very likely to be an iterative process and I don't get the optimum by just a formula and to compute the formula, you get it. Uh, but rather you, maybe you get some guess and then you can compute whether your guess is good or not, or if it's not good, where shall I go? After you update your parameters for a while, then it may be optimizing the objective function. Okay. So the basic idea is, um, so we're going to talk about gradient descent. So basically the gradient of a function or maybe the derivative of the function is how your function would respond given some change in the input. Okay. And in particular, the gradient of a multivariable input shows which is the direction that I can maximize the function very locally. And then, you know, it gives you the direction that you can increase your function. But if you go in the opposite way, then you are decreasing your function. So example. So suppose this is a one dimensional function, okay? It's a super simple. And this is my output, maybe Y. So the gradient of the function is actually just the derivative dy by dx, okay? It's a real number. So it's either positive or negative or maybe zero. So for this point, the gradient is positive. So let's assume the function is just Y equals X squared. Then the gradient of a point, then Y prime, is just two of x. Then at this point, maybe this point is one, then it's positive. You see the gradient y is evaluated at x equals one is maybe two. So it's positive. Then if you add some positive number to your input at this point, your current input is one, add some number, then the function increases, right? So you'd rather go in the opposite way. So if you move this point to this point, then your function value decreases, right? And likewise, if your current input is here, so I call it x here, okay? It's your current input, maybe it's minus one. Then the gradient evaluated at x equals minus one is uh, minus two, okay? So minus two is a, um, it's a negative number. So if you add the negative number to your current solution, maybe x, okay, then the x becomes even smaller. So it's even smaller. And in this case, again, the function value increases, right? But if you subtract the negative number, then the x becomes larger. If it's a little step, then you know you are here, then the function value decreases. Okay. So it shows that the gradient gives you the direction. So in this case, the gradient is a direction here, okay, it's one. You can think of it as a vector, but it's one. 
And in that case, the gradient is minus uh, two. The gradient is two. In this case, it's minus two. Okay. So it's a vector, but it's just a scalar. So if you follow the direction of your gradient, then the function value increases. If you follow the opposite direction of your gradient, then the function value decreases. And it's important to understand that the gradient is actually a vector, and maybe in this case, a scalar is also a vector, but um, the gradient is the vector in your input space. So suppose your input space is R D plus one, okay? then the gradient is a vector in d plus one. So the direction of your gradient or your derivative is this or that, okay? It should be in your input space, which is just a line. The gradient is not this vector, okay? Be careful. So the gradient is not how your function responds as well as how your input changes. It's actually the ratio of how your function responds by how your input changes, okay? So the gradient is a vector in your input space. In the two-dimensional case, x1, x2, okay. So maybe for this point, then the gradient of here is some, suppose it's here, suppose, you know, a point here, then the gradient is some direction here, okay. So it's within my x plane, okay, x1, x2 plane. So a gradient is a vector in your input. And if you move this direction, then your function value increases. If you move against this direction for a small step, then your function value decreases. So now we can work with the scalable again. So the gradient of a point is you take a hyperplane tangent at that point, and how you respond if your function is on this hyperplane in terms of each direction, okay? And if you follow the direction of your gradient, then you are maximizing the function to the largest extent locally. So I will have a claim. If my function is differentiable, differentiable function, so it's not necessarily convex, differentiable function. It's not necessarily convex. It can be something like this, or um, even it's not differentiable at some point. Okay, I'm saying it's a differentiable function. Then, then there exists some small step. I'm saying if you follow the opposite direction of my gradient, if you work for a very small step, then your function value would decrease. If you work too much, okay, so I say this is the direction that you can, so I'm pointing here. This is the direction that you can minimize the function locally. But if you work too much, okay, you have a very large step, then you are overshooting and you get the point here. So I'm saying there exists some alpha, which is small, but it's greater than a zero, then at x, okay? So a differentiable is differentiable at a local point there exists some alpha such that if my function minus the gradient, some small alpha times the gradient of my derivative at that point, so I'm going to the gradient descent, I'm taking the negative of my gradient but multiplied by a, an alpha, then this function value is less than or equal to f of x. Okay. And if uh, you know, the gradient is not a zero vector, it's not a greater zero vector, then uh, the inequality can hold strictly. Okay, so I'm saying for any function, as long as it's differentiable at some point. So if a function is differentiable at some point, then it's at least flat at that neighbor, okay, at that neighbor. Then within the neighbor, if you follow the opposite direction of your gradient, then you can optimize your function at least to a small extent. So this is this claim set. So now, I mean, it's not difficult to show that this holds because I can write out my, function as some Taylor expansion, okay? So now this time I'm using a Taylor expansion around a point in the neighbor of a point. So I'm saying with alpha 
tends to be zero. If alpha is not zero, then th this doesn't hold. But if f alpha is a small number, then this is equivalent. This is approximately f of x plus gradient of f of x. Okay. Transpose how your input changes. The how your input changes from here, from here to here is just minus alpha times the gradient of x, right? Then I have some residual term and the residual term is a high order small quantity of alpha. So I can say it's um, to alpha square, okay? So now if I have this residual term, I can make it equal. So this is not difficult to show that uh, if you know you follow the opposite direction of your gradient, then this term gives you minus alpha square um, times okay, which is the alpha uh, norm of x square. Don't forget the square, okay. So now I know this term is greater than or equal to zero. So the function value would decrease, okay, if the alpha goes to zero. So alpha could only be a small number. Then if it goes to zero, then yes. But if this term is strictly greater than zero, so saying the gradient is not a zero vector, okay, so you are not at the local optimum. Okay, if you are at the local optimum, then, um, you know, it's the best if you move around locally. But if it's not that those points, it's uh, any point around it, okay? Even if the gradient is very small, then you can always find a direction that I can still optimize the function to a small extent. So if it's greater than, strictly greater than zero, then this is uh, smaller than, okay, f of x. So this little derivation shows that if you follow the opposite direction of your gradient, then you can optimize your function to, uh, to some extent. Then if you keep doing this for a while, then you can reasonably expect that you can get to some optimum, right? So this will be supported by some other theorem, but we will not cover that in this course. That will be some theoretical analysis on the gradient descent. Uh, for example, you say the function derivative cannot change too much. And then your learning rate has to, your alpha has to satisfy some properties. It has to be large enough. You cannot, you know, work tiny, tiny steps and then um, you don't have much energy to move to the optimum, right? Or it cannot be too large, otherwise it will maybe overshoot or maybe it cannot settle down to the optimum. So theoretical results shows that if you have some constraints or some assumptions, then if you follow the gradient descent or follow the negative direction of your gradient, then you can optimize your solution to some optimum. So this gives us the gradient descent algorithm. So this is just the picture. So the gradient descent algorithm is, the goal is to optimize, to minimize some j of my w, okay? Where w is uh, some vector space, okay? I can call it d or d plus one. So the algorithm works like this. So I can randomly have a guess, okay? Randomly, initialize w zero, okay? So I call w a different iterative step as wt. Then, you know, at the beginning, I don't have any knowledge about the task or about the function. Then I randomly say something, maybe all zeros, okay? maybe all zeros, or maybe some small numbers around zero. So it doesn't differ too much in the linear regression problem. So I can just initialize them as all zeros. Then for iterations, for t iteration, I have an iteration equals one, two, three, until satisfied. We'll explain what it mean by satisfied. Okay. Then I can compute the partial derivative, compute the partial derivative, partial derivative of j, w, with respect to w, evaluated at w is your current step, your previous step, t minus one, okay? Then I can do the update. So my t step w is t minus one. 
So it's almost T minus one, except that you do a small modification. And the modification is against the derivative's direction, the gradient's direction, so minus alpha, a small step. J, no, sorry. Partial derivative of J with respect to W. Okay. Oh, I can write it more concisely. So I can define G, a G vector, which is my gradient, then this term is this. Okay. Then you do the iteration for many, many steps until you are satisfied. Then you return, okay, W, uh, maybe T, okay, I call the last step T. So this is my gradient descent algorithm. It's super simple. And I guess uh, many of you have known that. So here I have a few holes here. So how can I randomly initialize W? And um, how can I choose alpha? And what does it mean by I'm satisfied? So there could be a few holes here. But I'm just going to mention a few words about second order numerical optimization or Newton's method. So in the gradient descent, we only compute the derivative. So this is the first order derivative. But it's possible that we also work with the higher order derivative. And that gives you sometimes a better optimization if you can compute the higher order partial derivatives efficiently. So the idea of Newton's method is what if I do the Taylor expansion to the second order, okay? So I would say if t is uh, goes to zero, then I would say f of x plus t is approximately f of x plus gradient of f of x, okay, times t, of course, transpose, plus half t transpose f of x t, okay? No, so this is the second order derivative, okay? So this is the Hessian of x, of course, evaluate x. So sometimes you can represent Hessian of f, okay? But it's implicit here. And plus some small term of t, maybe the size of t to the power of three, okay? The third order. So now I can make it equal. Then you see, if we consider a local region of a function, then it's flat. I mean, it's, first it's constant if you do zero order approximation. If you do first order approximation, then it's flat. If you do second order approximation, then it's a quadratic form, right? So it says it's almost a quadratic form and it's better approximation of the first order, right? So assume f is indeed quadratic. So the gradient descent says it's flat, then which is the direction I should look at. But Newton's method says it's indeed um, quadratic, okay? The function is quadratic. Then can I solve t in a closed form solution and I can directly give you the result, quadratic, okay? So I would minimize my function so I can take the partial derivative of this function with respect to t. So I can take this function with respect to t, okay? And this gives me partial derivative of this plus, okay, so we know how to compute the partial derivative of a quadratic form for a matrix factor multiplication, it gives me two Hessian of x t. Okay, and I set it to zero. So, oh, so I forgot a half here, so I don't have this two. So now I say t equals minus Hessian of x inverse times the gradient of f of x, okay? 
So I directly solve the optimization problem if the function is indeed quadratic, but it may not be quadratic. So I keep updating my parameter like this, and then uh, it will eventually get to uh, optimum. Okay. So the Newton method, Newton's method says. So I also initialize. I have the same thing here. Okay, very ugly. So I'm not computing, not only computing the gradient, but also the Hessian is the second order derivative, okay, of J with respect to W, of course, evaluated at W equals W T minus one. Okay, this is my Hessian matrix and G is a gradient vector. So my update is not this, but my update is, you know, I would plus my parameter with T and T is this. Okay, so the update is, so it should be plus or minus, so I'm very slow, I just leave a question mark here. Okay, so now I would say the new parameter minus the old parameter should be minus this term. So the new parameter minus this term should be uh, T, should be the minus has an inverse times gradient, so it should be minus. Okay, done. This is the Newton's method, okay? So I have another picture for Newton's method. So for Newton's method, we are actually seeking for zero point of the derivative of my function, okay? So let's consider a one-dimensional case, so I'm seeking a zero point for the derivative of f. So I know f could be something like this, okay? This is the derivative, okay, sorry, it's not f, it's the derivative of f. You know, the Newton's method becomes wt is wt minus one, so it's the second order derivative, okay? Minus, sorry, times the first order derivative f of x prime, okay? So the second order derivative of f, which is the first order derivative of the derivative, right? So this is the slope of uh, the point of here in its derivative function. Then the second order derivative says how much this segment, this length divided by this length, okay? So one divided by two is my second order derivative, okay? Then, you know, if I have one over second order derivative, it gives me two divided by one, right? So this is one over f double prime of x, okay? Then I have to multiply by f prime of x. So I have f prime of x, but f prime of x is the value of this derivative function, which is one, okay? So this is one. So this term is one, okay? So it gives you the length of two. So the Newton's method says in the derivative function, I find a hyperplane and I find how this hyperplane segment with my input axis, okay? The x axis. Then I find this point and use it as my next update. So I get this, then I get this, okay? Then I get this. So eventually you will get to the zero point. Your zero point is here, okay? So suppose, so you know, the Newton's method uses the second order approximation. Suppose my function is indeed quadratic. So suppose my function is indeed quadratic. Is indeed quadratic. Okay, the derivative is just a linear function, okay? Suppose my function is f of x is x squared, then f of prime of x is x two x, okay? It's a linear function. Then for any point here, you apply the same thing, right? You find the tangent hyperplane or tangent line, which is the function itself because the gradient itself is linear. 
then you find so the this line the tangent line is just it okay then you find how this tangent line cuts the input axis it's here then you just move your point from here your parameter from here to here in the in one update and you direct you get that right so this is another picture for newton's method but usually we don't have a exact quadratic function so you still need a few updates to get it but it converges much faster than the gradient descent. So we will not touch any convergence rate in this course. So if you're interested in the convergence rate, you can search on the internet and you will find many tutorials or papers. So I don't think it's too difficult for us if you are equipped with the previous knowledge we have discussed. So it's basically some assumptions and then you bound the difference and then you do some inequality and you'll get it. So in the gradient descent, the convergence is proportional to one over your time steps. Okay, so it's linear decay. So it's linearly close to your optimum. But Newton's method is quadratically close to your optimum. So you need way fewer steps to approach to the optimum. But there could be also some drawbacks of Newton's method. For example, it may be stuck at some saddle point, right? You remember uh, if we have a saddle point, the derivative is zero. So it's not a convex function and the derivative is zero at the saddle point. The Newton's method, you are very happy with this point because it's seeking for the zero point for the first order derivative. And it's indeed zero here. But gradient descent says, I'm looking for the direction that can minimize my function in the local range. But if my point is precisely on this saddle point, then I have no gradient. But I cannot be that precise at that so if you are around a little bit, then you still have some gradient and you may escape from the saddle point. So this is one disadvantage of second order optimization. And another disadvantage is computing the Hessian matrix. The inverse especially is not very fun. So you suppose in the neural network regime, you have a million parameters that is possible, but then you compute a million by a million matrix is not fun. And then you want to compute the inverse, it's a disaster. So uh, there has been a lot of work, uh, like looking how to approximate the inverse of the Hessian. For example, you can do the inverse in an incremental fashion along your learning. So you don't have to compute the inverse every time. Or maybe you can approximate that by some diagonal matrices or by some low rank matrices. So there are a lot of variants for that. So this is the gradient descent and the Newton's method. But for this course, we are mainly focusing on the gradient descent the first order optimization. I mentioned there are a few holes. Uh, first, how to do the initialization, initialize. And how can I stop my training and how can I choose alpha? So the following will be some intuitive pictures or some philosophical discussion. It will not be proof, it will not be theoretical results. So how can I do initialization? So initialization um, for convex problems. You know, it usually doesn't matter. Because if you find some point whose gradient is zero, then you know it's the global optimum. So for convex optimization, it doesn't matter, right? But sometimes it's not convex, especially in the deep neural network setting. Uh, sometimes you have some symmetry over your parameters. So W1 and W2, they're the same, right? But if you all optimize them at zero, then the gradients are the same. Then after you update your parameters, they will keep being the same. So you lose your model power. So there's some symmetry in your error space. So suppose this is J and this is W1, W2, okay? It's maybe symmetric in your error space. So it's very ugly, I have very bad drawing, okay? But somehow it's symmetric, okay? So this is known as the error surface, by the way. So if the error surface is symmetric in your parameter space, then, you know, if you initialize them all zero, then it has no gradient. And for non convex problems, if its gradient is zero, it doesn't mean it's the optimum, it's maybe the very bad point, or it may be the uh, maximum, right? It may be some point like this, and it has no gradient, but it's an unstable C 
stationary point. So it's actually maximize the function in the local range. It's no good. So in this case, you'd rather initialize your parameters randomly around the origin, around zero, okay? You just randomly pick a few points around, then it's fine. And you don't want to pick too large weights. So sometimes your, uh, a very large weight may give you a large gradient, and then you may overshoot a little bit. Right? So you just pick some small numbers around origin, like from minus one to one or minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5, you know. So you just pick some small numbers. And usually it doesn't matter too much as long as it's in the reasonable range. Second, how can I determine the gradient update is satisfied? So the termination, okay. So, you know, this is an iterative process. And we know for any algorithm, it have to stop at some point. I cannot run an algorithm forever and I wait until the universe terminates and I take a look at my program, it doesn't work. So how can I determine when shall I terminate my algorithm? So I have a few suggestions. So first, you can determine the number of epoch based on your budget. For example, on some clouds, you are allowed to run for three hours. Why not? Let's just run for three hours and see what happens, right? So this is one choice, the simplest choice. And the second is you can monitor the training loss, monitor, monitor the training loss. Okay. So maybe after you update for quite a while, then you are almost good, although you are not exactly optimum, right? For example, I have a very flat optimum like this. And, you know, if you are uh, moving around, at some point you are here, you are moving around here, then for any point, the loss doesn't change too much, right? So in this case, you can plot the, how your training loss changes along with your iterations, okay? And in this case, sometimes you will see it like this, okay, then you probably, you know, know that at this point, after this point, your model is reasonably well trained, okay? And at which point it's subjective. So maybe this point, but if you are not very satisfied, you can pick this point and it's a little bit better optimized, okay? So you can monitor the training loss. Or uh, more importantly, we know that uh, we don't care about training loss at all for machine learning, right? So we mainly care about the measure of success. So, which is my error. So why not let's monitor the measure of success, okay? On some unseen data. And now this time it gives me, maybe the error looks like this, okay? And this is very typical. You first, the error goes down to a large extent and then it may go up a little bit. If that is the case, then you can pick the minimum point here, okay? Or if it doesn't go up, then, you know, still at some point you can truncate at some point and you say, okay, there's no gain after a few while, or maybe uh, the gain is minimal, it's very small. After you train for maybe 20 iterations, then you're fine. Okay, monitor the measure of success. Do I have the third approach? I don't have uh, a third approach. Um, but I do have one suggestion. You, you can say uh, your program runs for a long time, especially if you are doing some machine learning engineering, you don't have to predetermine how long your program works, okay? So run for a long time. And especially you store your W once a while, maybe W10, okay? After 10 updates, I store it 20, so on and so forth, or maybe I mean, it's up to how many epochs you train. Maybe I, after 100 epochs, I store it, okay? And then I uh, still monitor the measure of success and I can pick some W as I like, or if it's not finished. So maybe after you run for 200 iterations, then your loss is still going down to a large extent. You can continue training, right? So uh, this is not a new way, but it's a suggestion when you do development or when you do engineering, then this is way better than um, you have a fixed criteria. Like I train my model until my measure of success is not improving for five updates. But maybe after a while you feel the training is not sufficient and you want to continue training, then you have to restart from scratch. But if you store the parameters 
and then you can reload your parameters. You can continue training. So this is just a suggestion. The next point would be, uh, how can I choose alpha? So the alpha is known as the learning rate. Okay. It basically determines how large you would go for each step. But this is not directly specifying the length of your update. It's rather specifying how much it will go proportional to your gradient, right? So if you have a larger gradient, you know this is relatively a bad point, so you would move a larger step. But if the gradient is small, then it's relatively a good point, then the alpha should be small. How can I choose this alpha? So intuitively, you can try different alphas and you see whether your alpha gives you optimization. So if your alpha is too large, then you are overshooting, right? So, okay, so this is my function. And my gradient's here, so if you do an update, I'm moving my uh, points to this direction. If my alpha is too large, then I get here. I get here. Then I do it again with a very large alpha, then I do here, okay? So I'm overshooting, and the performance becomes worse and worse. So this can be reflected by the loss. So if your loss goes to infinity, then the alpha should be much smaller. And if your alpha is too small, then I'm going very tiny baby step, okay? So I'm having very, very tiny baby step, and it may take too much time to reach to the optimal, okay? It's still, it's not efficient. So you should try different alphas and see which is the best. And the other thing is maybe you can decrease your alpha along your training, right? For example, um, if your point is around the optimum, you want to, you want model to converge more precisely, or you want to get closer to the optimum, right? Then if you have a larger alpha, then you are just walking around and you, you are indeed in this catchment basin, but you are never exact at that point, okay? So this is another thing for decreasing your alpha. So this is one heuristic that you can decrease your alpha along the training and you can develop different heuristics. For example, if my measure of success does not improve, then I decrease my alpha half. Or maybe I can say I continuously decrease my alpha by some power rate, okay? So alpha to the power of iteration, okay? Maybe some another hyperparameter gamma uh, to the number of iterations, so it's power decay. Or maybe you can have exponential decay or linear decay as you like, or cosine decay as you like. And sometimes people say, okay, I, I sometimes need warm up. So at the beginning, maybe my learning rate should be small because it may be very sharp, okay? So I have some warm up. So my learning rate starts from small. And then at some point I start decay like this, okay? It's also possible. So this is the uh, warm up of my learning rate. So they are all common in machine learning practice. And in particular, if you have some a little bit more complicated scheduling of alpha, it's known as the learning rate scheduling. Right, so you start from small numbers and then you grow it, grow the uh, alpha by some warm up, and then you decrease it along your training by some heuristic. Okay, the next important thing is adaptive learning rate for each dimension for each parameter. Okay. So this says, I have a bunch of parameters to optimize. So for some parameters, maybe it gives you stable gradient. So it says I should continue working in this direction for my parameter, okay? It should be continuous increasing. Then I should have a larger learning rate for that parameter, then I increase it to a larger extent. If some other parameters gives you unstable gradient or unstable derivative, it says sometimes I want to increase, sometimes I want to decrease or increase, decrease again, it has a large variance. Then you should have a smaller learning rate for that, right? So in this way, you will have some alpha times maybe I call it 
um, some gamma, okay, maybe gamma is a vector, uh, point wise product by gradient, okay? So the gamma just stores some information, for example, whether the gradient is uh, stable or not. So eventually it will give me maybe gamma one, G one, they are scalar product, okay? Up to gamma N, G N. So this tells me if my GI is stable or not. If it's stable, then I should uh, have a larger gamma one. And this tells me if GN is stable or not among the different updates. And if it's also stable, then you should have larger gamma N. If it's not stable, then you should have smaller gamma N, okay? So this is the idea of adaptive learning rate. And it's actually very intuitive if you understand why gradient may not be the correct direction to go in optimization. So let's say my training loss is an elongated ellipse, okay? So it's very elongated. So I have two dimensions of the input, x1, x2. And this is my loss, okay? It's an ellipse, so it's a variable, uh, but it's not a circle, okay? You just uh, flatter in this dimension, and then it gives you a very elongated ellipse. So I can plot the level line, so you know, so I say this level is um, here, and this level, you know, is here, okay, so and so forth. Okay, so this is known as the contour, right? So you have this aligned with this, and this along with this, so and so forth, this is known as the contour. Contour. Okay. So let me make it nicer. Okay, what if this is my contour? So this time I just collapse the y axis. So you can think of x1 and x2, they're here, okay? So this is x1, x2. So the y-axis is something pointing out of my screen, okay? So, so you can think of this as x1, x2, and the y-axis is something here, right? So now I can draw the level line uh, projected to my input space and gives me the contour. So let's think of what is the derivative or the gradient at this point, okay? A gradient on the contour is something orthogonal, okay, perpendicular to your contour. So the gradient is making my function larger and you know, the outer circle is larger. So the gradient is somewhere here, right? But what is my gradient descent? What is the direction of my gradient descent? So the Gradient descent is the opposite of gradient, so you are pointing to this point. But where is my optimum? My optimum is here. So you are pointing to this point. Okay. So the optimum says you should go left, but your gradient says you should go down. Okay. So this shows that your gradient is almost orthogonal to your correct direction. Okay. This is highly undesired. If you can work with the the adaptive learning rate, you will find that the gradient, you know, after you do a few steps, so I can make it even larger. Okay. So I can have a thinner pen. Okay. So if you do gradient descent on this point, so you are likely that you are going zigzag, okay, along this way. But if you are using the, you know, adaptive learning rate, then it's possible that you know the gradient in this direction, G1, is very stable. It always points you to this direction. So now you should uh, have a larger learning rate for that direction. But the gradient in the um, X2 direction, which is G2, is unstable. Sometimes it should ask you to go down, sometimes go up, go down, go up. Then after a while, you know this direction should have a lower learning rate, so it's smoother, right? So after you have a lower learning rate in Y, then you get something more stable. And actually uh, your G1 is larger. So it's possible that you can get to the optimum faster than if you do zigzag, okay? So this is some intuitive understanding 
how the adaptive learning rate would work. And the similar idea is the momentum saying the gradient I'm going to update is not only the gradient at this moment, but I'm also having the gradient, uh, maybe a moving average of previous few steps. So it also mitigates this problem saying, okay, if I have a moving average of my gradient, then um, you know the effect is smooth out, right? The zigzag effect is smooth out. But if my gradient stable is always pointing to my, this direction in some axis, then I should keep going this way. So this is some other direction like momentum. So you're just having a moving average of your previous gradient as the gradient for update. So this is really some great advance in the past few years in the machine learning community. And uh, it's a very principled approach and you can prove some theorems saying how is the convergence for these algorithms uh, under some assumptions. And maybe some of them I, are some approximation of high order optimizations, but we're not going to cover them in this course. This is the first course in machine learning, and this is not a very theoretical course. So I have a final comment on how to compute the gradient. So in the gradient descent, the key step is the gradient, is computing the gradient, okay? Um, and we know that um, J, which is my loss function, is the average of different samples, then my prediction minus my true target square, okay? And obviously the complexity is proportional to my M, okay? So suppose uh, the dimension is a constant, then we don't care about how the problem scales in terms of the dimension. So maybe in some tasks, I have a hundred samples, but sometimes I have a thousand samples or 10,000 samples or even a million of samples. Then computing the loss itself is proportional to how many samples you have for that. And computing the gradient is the same complexity, okay? The complexity of computing the gradient has the same complexity as computing the loss, okay? So now we see some problem. You know, if you have a very large data set, then the computation for the gradient is very slow. And most importantly, we know that at the beginning especially, your gradient does not give you a correct direction. So even if you use a million samples to compute the gradient, it gives you a wrong direction, right? So it's very inefficient. So an um, approximation will be I use a subset of my samples to estimate the loss, okay? So the loss is the gradient of this, okay? But how about I say my loss is approximately the gradient, so I, I don't need the gradient. So I say my loss is approximately a subset, maybe my set is B, okay? Then I have W transpose XM or TM, okay? So from one to B, okay? And here my TM, uh, xm, okay, m from one to m is, sorry, from one to b is a subset of my, of course, I also have the targets because we're doing supervised learning of my d train, okay? So I can pick a small subset of my entire training set and then I compute the loss based on my subset, right? So it's a estimate of my loss. And then if you compute the gradient over my small subset, then it's way more efficient. For example, I can estimate the gradient by uh, 10 samples, then or by 100 samples. Then it's way more efficient than you compute the gradient by a million of samples and it gives you a wrong direction, right? So in this case, if you have a uh, um, a million samples, but if your subset is a hundred, 
then you can compute maybe thousands of updates, okay? After you work maybe thousands of updates, the gradient gives you a much better direction and your optimization is way more efficient. So this is known as the batch, uh, mini batch learning. Batch learning. So this is a very common variant of the gradient descent. Now the same thing, the choice of such subsets, you have different choices, right? So for example, you can say sampling with replacement. Then every time I just pick a hundred samples in my entire data set, right? Maybe I have a million of samples in total. I just randomly pick a hundred samples and then I estimate the gradient and I do an update, uh, but I put the previous samples back and I resample again. So it gives you uh, sampling with replacement. Or you can do sampling without replacement. I say I get a hundred samples out and then I compute the gradient, I do the update. Then I get another hundred samples. Those samples will not be overlapping with my previous samples. In this way, you can better utilize every single sample because you will not have duplicate and you will not miss samples either, okay? So this is more common. Essentially, sampling without replacement says, this is my entire training set, okay? And I can have different buckets for my training set, okay? So suppose my training set has a total size of M and suppose my size is B, the subset, the batch is B, the size of B, then I have M divided by B, that many small buckets, okay? And of course, maybe there are some, a few residual samples, then you can take the seeding or whatever. So we ignore this detail, okay? So now I still have my first sample, my second sample, but uh, so I can redraw it. This is my entire data set. And suppose my entire data set is uh, 20 samples. And suppose my B is five, okay? Then you get uh, five, five, five. Then you have four buckets, right? So this is X1, X2, until you have X five, okay? So of course they, they are accompanied with their targets, so I just ignore those. So the targets are omitted. Then this is X6 until X10, X11 until X15, X16 until X20, okay? So for your first update, you use these five samples to do a gradient update. Then for the second update, you use the sixth to the 10th samples to do the gradient update, okay? To, come, to estimate the gradient of your overall loss, but it's just the loss of this data sample and this and this, then it gives you a full updates in a single pass of your entire data set, okay? So the mini batch gradient descent the algorithm is four. I still need to go over my training samples many, many times, okay? So that is known as an epoch. For epoch is one to up to uh, many until satisfied, okay? So an epoch just means single pass over my training set. Then I have four batches, okay? For batch is one, two, okay, one, two, until, you know, the number of batches. Here I have four batches, so the number of batches, okay? The total number of batches. Then I compute, I estimate my gradient is, uh, I compute my gradient as the gradient of your weights for the loss okay. 
the average loss, the gradient of your average loss in that batch. Okay. So I need two subscripts to represent that. So maybe I call it. Okay, so I need two subscripts to represent it, but I can write it in another way saying, uh, okay, so I say my X, I pick one data sample from my batch, okay, from my batch such that um, I have the gradient, I have the loss of my particular data sample, okay? So this is a Kraven notation. So this batch is just a batch you have, okay? So you have this B1, B2. So you have a iteration over the batch, okay? If you work out the index, it's simple calculation, but I'm very slow, so I don't want to calculate it. And I update. Okay, so this is known as the mini batch algorithm. So you have one more loop over the batches and you estimate the gradient based on only the samples in each of the batch. Okay, and a little bit terminology issue. So if your B is M, so it's just terminology, it's nothing complicated terminology. If your B equals M, then, you know, this is known as the four batch gradient descent or the, you know, traditional version of the gradient descent. If B is one, this is known as the stochastic gradient descent, stochastic gradient descent. SGD, and if B is greater than or less than M, this is known as the mini batch, okay? But this is just terminology issues. I don't see why you can't say my mini batch is one, okay? And some people in research papers, if some people refer to SGD, they usually refer to mini batch, okay? So they usually refer to mini batch. Then the advantage in Disadvantage is advantage and disadvantage of these things. So for full batch, the advantage is the gradient is precise. Okay, so it gives you very precise gradient. But for the category descent, the gradient is not precise. It's estimated by a few samples. Okay. Then the disadvantage for the full batch is it's slow to compute G, okay? Because uh, you have to average over all samples, but then uh, the G, the gradient may give you a wrong direction, so it's slow but it's efficient to compute G, okay? And, you know, um, mini batch is in the middle. So this is in the middle. So it's a trade-off between the efficiency of your gradient and how uh, precise is your gradient. So I just have one more comment. The mini batch version of my gradient is actually the most widely applied approach in modern neural network practice. And the main reason is first you can control the batch sizes, okay, from small to large as you like. And then also it's highly parallel when you do GPU computation because you have a thick matrix and then you can parallel the computation, usually like a handful of samples or a hundred of samples. Okay. And some research also shows that even if a small batch, for example, my batch size is just one or maybe a few, Oh, it's not precise gradient, but it shows that sometimes it gives you better results in non-convex optimization. 
something like this. It shows that uh, stochastic grid descent may be better escaping from a local optimum, or it may be settled down to a flat optimum that you are more robust. But the precise reason has not been very well understood in the theoretical side, but there could be some intuition like uh, maybe small batch is good, but it's not parallel in GPU computation. Maybe we do need a, a mini batch with maybe uh, maybe dozens of samples or hundreds of samples. Okay. And also we can compare the closed form solution with the closed form solution with the numerical optimization. Then the advantage, so I can say pros and cons. You, you know, we mentioned it's simple. And also uh, it's precise solution. If it's numerical stable, okay. If numerical stable. The cons is um, sometimes you don't get the closed form solution, no closed form solution. And even if you have the closed form solution, um, it may be slow in computation and it may be numerically unstable. But for numerical optimization, um, the pros is, um, you know, it's also simple. I mean. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, it, it, it requires a few lines of code of the, you know, this algorithm, but it's also simple. It's not too difficult. Um, so, so I'll say this. So, Numerical optimization is usually you can seek for some numerical optimization for most problems. You can seek uh, for most problems. It can be optimized in the numerical sense. Work for most problems. Especially you can do all sorts of approximations. Even if I can't find the precise optimum, I can find local optimum. Oh, I don't even need to find the optima. I just find something good. Okay, that's good. that's it. Oh, I don't even have to find the optima. I can find something like a lower bound and I, I optimize my lower bound. I, I feel very happy. That's also fine. So it can be, oh, it, it, it works for most problems and I can do all kinds of approximations. And the pros is sometimes uh, efficient. Sometimes efficient. Okay. So it really depends on how many samples you have and how large is the dimension. If you have a very high dimensional case, then numerical optimization would be way more efficient than that. So, but I would say, um, so uh, for computing the inverse, but here, so I would say, Close form solution may be slow when you have the inverse or you have the eigenvector or eigenvalue or you have the determinant. These things are not fun, okay? Then for the numerical optimization, it's usually, um, so you don't have those, you know, cubic operations. So usually it's efficient in each update. And of course, it may not be precise and require many updates. Okay, by simple, I can say just means the get the results by one formula. Okay, very good. So that's it for this lecture. And in the next lecture, we are going to give some probability interpretations for the mean square error for linear regression. There will be some other lengthy dis 